Brilliant. Okay, so the we were just discussing there the different the different styles that you've practiced over the last fifty years of being being involved in martial arts, uh, mainly mainly karate and uh, kung fu, and then tai chi has played a, a major part. Yeah, I'd say well. the main styles I've practiced are karate, tai chi, um, iaido. Uh, Jodo, um, which was part of the Iaido, mm -hmm. um, and I have made, if you like, my own style of kung fu. Yeah, I mean, the one of the things that always interests me about people like yourself that have just dedicated a huge amount of time to the arts, uh, and this is the main thing that I'd love to start with today is how have you seen how have you seen the martial arts? progress and change. And again, a lot of that might be positive, some might be negative. Uh, how have you seen it from when you first started to really up to the present day? It's obviously it's changed a lot. Um, I'd say back in the 1970s, it was a cult. Okay. So uh, very much young men bashing the hell out of each other. Yep. Um, you wouldn't dare not go training or not turn up because everyone would turn up to your house to see where you was. Okay. Um, so uh, in those days, for me, it was quite violent. And um, I was working in the security industry as well. So I probably felt quite at home there. Mm -hmm. um, when, I, um, when I joined Wadaroo, I joined Terra. Um, association when that first came out with Kodos Kamazawa and switched my style to Wadaru and um, started training with Toru and taking private lessons with him. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that um, going from a kind of a, a, I suppose, a fighting base to a traditional Japanese art, um, that, that was a big change and that took place in the late 70s. And then I think that, um, that obviously doing the Aido and Jodo, they were very traditional Japanese. Tai Chi was very traditional Chinese. Uh, but the clubs in themselves and the type of clubs, it, it's not so much of how the change has taken place, but the fact that there's so many more people training. Yeah. So it's gone from clubs of just young guys in a sort of cult type environment, bashing each other around to uh, being very much family-oriented arts. Many, many more children, something like more than two-thirds of people training now yeah. are children. Yep. Um, so I think that um, it's become more of a gym environment, more of a uh, community club environment, mm -hmm. which I'm, I'm very happy with. Yep. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. I think that being able to present martial arts to all different types of people in society, I think is, is a good thing. And I think because the arts themselves have massively expanded, there's virtually no governance in the arts at all. So there's no kind of set standards, which to be honest, can be a good and a bad thing. Uh -huh. yep, yep. Uh, so I, I think it goes from uh, street fighter to Buddhist priest to gymnast to uh, uh, film star fighting to you know to wushu to competitive kata to traditional kung fu and tai chi. Yeah. Um, so it's a very very broad base, and and that in itself I think is a good thing. But it, it does mean that anybody wanting to train in the arts have got to be very careful that they pick a club and an instructor that suits them. Yeah, that, that's one thing that I've noticed about, uh, especially following your social media, that you you seem to have a, a very, and it's something that I admire, you have a very balanced outlook on things and uh, a very welcoming uh, attitude towards the different things that people can do. You, you said there again, and it's, it's something that I've, I've heard you say quite often about it being a, a broad church in the there might not be a place for absolute, or maybe there is a place for everybody, but 
go, you, I, I, I took a wee note there when you mentioned the word cult, which has quite negative connotations, but uh, you still see that nowadays in, in, in many places where it's, it's my way or, or no way at all, and this is the correct way, and this is the wrong way. And you seem to have a, and maybe it's from all those years' experience, you seem to have a, a lovely attitude actually towards, no, there's a place for, for everybody to enjoy the arts. Is that, is that right? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, different people train for different reasons. So a lot of people will join a club because it's close to them. Uh, they're not particularly looking for a high standard. You know, if you, if you wanted to learn to swim, you'd go to your local swimming club. Yep. You'd have a, a little fat old lady with a whistle that's teaching you how to swim. Um, w when you can swim, if you wanted to compete, you would look for a high level coach. Um, you would look for a county coach, then a national coach, then an international coach. Yep. Uh, so you would kind of climb, climb the ladders, so there are, which takes nothing away from the little old lady with the whistle. You know, yep. she's there to, to bring people into a sport. Uh, and particularly in martial arts, you know, a lot of people want to join a friendly club to start. Um, and uh, there are a lot of clubs that fulfill that role. So uh, they want a club that's local. They want a club that's friendly. Um, and most people would be attracted to that kind of club. Yeah. If they then enjoy the arts and they want to move on, they're going to find a, a kind of a higher quality, quality coach from there. Yeah. So, you know, I'd say that our club here is, is a welcoming, particularly a family-oriented club. Yeah. Uh, we love having children, we love people with disabilities, uh, we love all genders. Um, the people that come and train with me personally would come on to my Tai Chi training program and they would often tend to be higher level instructors yeah. uh, that want training and those that go on to the advanced um, are the ones that want the martial aspects of Tai Chi, but it's deep. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think there are coaches for all different kinds of people, really, and that, of course, is, is, is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, if, we were, if we were to, to take a moment and, and, and drill down a wee bit on, or even sort of make a, make a list of, of, a, of a couple of things on each side of the best changes that you've seen over 50 years, which when you think it's a huge amount of time. Uh, yeah. So the, the sort of the better changes and then maybe a couple on the opposite side that you think maybe we've went wrong with, if, if that's, that's a fair question. I would say that um, without a doubt, if, if you look at the fighters, they are much better trained. They're, they're much higher skilled. Yeah. If you look at the martial arts athletes uh, that might compete in Tessa or forms, um, at a high level, they're, they're absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, you look at some of the Wushu people, yeah. um, in terms of Tai Chi, they break every single rule that I teach. Um, but they're brilliant. You know, they're, they're, they're athletic and they're very good at what they do. So I think we've got, on the good side, we've got much higher trained athletes mm -hmm. for, both, for competing in all senses, from MMA to... Uh, kickboxing to karate, yeah. kung fu, semi-contact, full contact, much, much higher level. Um, there's a lot of lower competitions that a lot of people would kind of say, oh, they're rubbish, but mm -hmm. you, you've still got to start somewhere. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, a good governing body would have graded, regulated competitions for beginners right the way through the grades. They would have referees uh, at, that were trained to referee at all levels. Um, they would, anyone who wanted to compete would compete at a certain grade level or skill level. Uh, they would have to be healthy. They would have had to have taken a health check yeah. and so on and so forth. We've got none of that yeah. um, because we've got no governance. Yeah. But by the same token, you still can go along to a, to a local competition, uh, you know, and gradually kind of skill build. You'd, you'd have to be quite careful because... It's very easy in competition for someone going for their first competition to end up facing a world champion. Yeah, yeah. And that is a shame. That, that shouldn't happen. Uh, but unfortunately, there's not a lot that we can do about that. So you can see the good and the bad side yeah. um, there. A lot of people go on about uh, business and money and so on. But 
actually, I don't, I don't think that counts at all. What you're really looking at is can people come into a safe environment and start their journey on martial arts? It doesn't have to be a very high quality coach, but it's got to be at least safe, well insured, and, yeah. and so on. Yeah. Um, and then is there, is there a ladder of excellence that they can climb? Unfortunately, uh, somebody in the martial arts has to build their own ladder because one doesn't exist as it is. So you would have to go and find your next coach each time. Yeah. Um, but for, for anyone that wants to do their due diligence, it's, it's not that hard. Yeah, it's what well, I, I would hope, I would hope that the, the same way your club obviously is, uh, I would hope that we are inclusive of everyone and that there's a, there's a home for, for children. I mean, our, our youngest student is in our sort of preschool classes. And our mm. old student is 67 or 68. Now, that's not in the same class. That's in, in different, different classes. Uh, but I, I hope that we are inclusive of everyone. But one of the accusations, not necessarily towards my school, but just to, to, to schools like mine's or, or yours in, in, certain, in certain ways, is that uh, we, aren't, we aren't tough enough. We aren't sawdust on the floor enough type thing you know and it's not all it's not all blood blood and guts uh what's your thoughts on that because it it used to get my back up a bit and now being a wee bit more mature i hope i just sort of let it let it go but i, I i'm really proud of the standard that i produce as are you but it's not all about just knocking yeah. each other's head in yeah we we don't need to be defensive you know, so uh, as I said before, it is a broad church. It contains all kinds of different people with all kinds of different opinions. Um, and as I say, you know, opinions are like assholes. If you have got one, you know. So, <laughs> so social media gives everyone a voice. Basically, I think what we've all learned on social media is to ignore the idiots and. Um, uh, unfriend and block them and if you just keep unfriended and blocking anyone that is an idiot you end up with quite a nice group of people indeed my, my fear on that is is that you and maybe you've put that a wee bit differently actually my fear is is that you end up in a in a sort of echo chamber but but the way you've put that's a wee bit better it, it's not about uh, it's not about not allowing people to disagree with you it's the manner in sure. which we treat each other uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think if you if you treat someone's social media page as if you're visiting them in their home, um, you, you're probably going to work it the right way. You know, you be polite. It's their house. You respect their opinion. Yep. You're not going to argue politics or whatever with them um, in their house unless you're both good friends and have got kind of agreed parameters and you're, yep. you're not going to get upset with each other. But um, I would treat everybody, if you notice, you've never seen me knocking anybody, not even on my own page. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, the, the idea really is point, point to what's good. And if you, the only time you look down on somebody is to give them a help, helping hand upwards. Yeah, and just I just ignore the others, and if they if they're too intrusive, I just block them. Well, one of the th one of the things uh, one of the things that I I enjoy most about your page is 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 the, the stuff that you share, and as you, you mentioned this earlier on, uh, just a, a, this different all the good stuff from completely different styles, uh, some really traditional stuff, some. Uh, musical kata stuff, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, I went through <laughs> I went through a wee stage on your page uh, with one of the little emojis with the sort of the wee chap winking uh, and typing under your videos that would never work on the street type thing. Only, mm. only at, for fun because it seems to be a common thread that you you're sharing all of this wonderful martial arts and and and, and lots of different. Uh, styles and everyone has to come back and say 
oh, that wouldn't work, and it's this and it's that. Yeah. They're completely missing the point, are they not? Well, and I tend to know most of those people or know of them. Yeah. And um, I would say the same about their stuff. There's a kind of a people in glass houses. Uh, <laughs> inevitably, those throwing the stones do live in glass houses themselves. Yeah. And, and I've got to be honest, a lot of the self-defense type stuff that, or adaptive stuff that I see from my own experience wouldn't work on the street either. So, uh, yeah. I, so I, I just let it go. I just leave it. Okay. Again, this, this next question, I think, is uh, it's a really broad one. And what I'd, what I'd love to do today, and, and as I say, I'm really excited with the opportunity, Steve, of, of chatting with you, but I just want to give you a wee bit of inspiration and then, and then let, you, let you educate us all, to be honest. Uh, you seem to be one of these masters, grandmasters, uh, one of these high-level martial artists who their martial arts has clearly spread through every area of their life. Uh, let, let's talk a wee bit about that, if that's okay, because yeah, sure. you, you never, it's, I've never once seen you act in a way, even when we're, there's, people are joking online, et cetera, et cetera, I've never seen you in any other way than what I would recognize you to be, if that makes sense. There isn't the karate, kung fu, tai chi, Steve Rowe, and the, the other Steve Rowe. It seems to have really infused right right through your life. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I was a master up until I was about thirteen, and then I became a mister. Okay. Yep. You know, so you. Um, you won't see me using titles of, of any description at all, other than my name. So, um, and I've got to be careful that I'm not playing the reverse snobbery thing here. Yeah, um, I, I've got nothing against titles. I've got nothing against people that use them. Um, it, it really is no big deal. But I'm a, a council estate lad that grew up in South London. Um, you know, I've been everything from a person that digs up roads to running a security company. Um, so, but I am an English South London guy off the street. That's it. Yeah. And um, I train for myself. Mm -hmm. And that is my primary purpose for everything that I've ever done. So even things like grading society, they, they don't mean a lot to me simply because I've never been one. If you, you won't have seen me at any award ceremonies, yeah. I've always refused them. Uh, which again, is not a kind of inverse snobbery. It's just not who I am. Mm -hmm. And, and I train for myself, I train every single day. You, you know the health problems I've got, you know the disability problems I've got. Yep. Um, I'm on two crutches to move around. I have to do most of my training these days sitting down. I have to teach from sitting down, but I still do my bit every single day sim simply because it's for me. Yeah. And I've never seen training as a burden. I've always enjoyed it. There's nothing I enjoy more than coming downstairs from my flat upstairs in, into the dojo each day, um, taking some deep breaths, pulling myself up straight, a little bit of quietness and meditation, and then going through my routines. That's what keeps me healthy. And to be honest, it, what, it's what keeps me sane. I need that alone time mm -hmm. to uh, be able to deal with my own problems. So, you know, if you talk about sort of being, a, I don't know, a master or something, most definitely I'm still dealing with my own problems. Um, so I, I've got some advice to give because I've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. I don't even see, in a way, in my own mind, I don't even see myself as a teacher. I see myself as somebody who enjoys sharing. So yeah. it's a, if you ever come into any of my programs, it's more like, you know, when the guys get down the pub and we talk about martial arts. It's more yeah. that kind of feeling than it is 
me kind of standing back and, and being a, a remote teacher. So in a way, fundamentally, my own training and meditation and uh, the meaning of life is the most important thing to me. Um, and as a secondary aspect, I enjoy sharing that with people that want to um, share it with me. Yeah. So kind of that describes how I function, really. Yeah. The, uh, again, I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll be selfish during, during this opportunity that I have today and ask, uh, ask for a bit of advice, I guess, personally, or just your thoughts on that. I, the, the students who have been with me the longest, they, they, they would have heard this a number of times. Uh, I like to see myself as a facilitator of learning. I, I love that uh, title. It's not about coming to my school and me being up here and the students being here. I like to see it. And again, the people that are just listening to this, they won't see what I'm doing with my hands, but I like it to be a... Yeah, they can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like to see it as a as a a, a a mashup where we we're exchanging information and knowledge. And if there's something I don't know, I'm definitely just that person that facilitates that learning. That facilitates the well, yeah, go and look it, here or go and look there or try this. If or I, try could, that. I was going to say, if I can stop you there. First of all, I've just realised I've got a tick next to me. Yeah, which is pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Secondly, uh, yeah, I, I think if we talk about good coaching, what we're really talking about is we're there to support other people, not to dictate. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, you know, my basic premise is that I would look at a class and say, what does this group need most right now? And that's what I give them. And an individual person, what does this person need most right now? That's what I give them. The biggest problem I think with a lot of people when they teach is they make it about them. There's a very narcissistic approach with a lot of teachers. Actually, uh, you you don't count. You're not important. The student's important. Yeah. So it, it, it's not about how clever you are or what you can do or what even what you think. It really doesn't matter. What matters is what does this person need? Mm -hmm. you know, what do they need right now? What can you give them that will help them? And that's playing a, a, a supportive role yeah. rather than a, a kind of dogmatic or di dictatorial role. Yeah. How, how have... Uh, one, one of my good friends who I had on the podcast a, a number of episodes ago is a, is a mindfulness teacher. And he... Uh, Martin Stepik's his name. And he has been learning and teaching and... Uh, mindfulness for, for, for a good number of years and one of the things I was chatting to him about was a lot of your influences and a lot of your what's pro maybe giving you the, the mind that you have at the moment are, are eastern influences I guess uh, not all but, but it seems that some of them are and there seems to be a watering down might be too to to rude a way of putting it, but where where do you where do you stand on so many people doing meditation and mindfulness and et cetera, et cetera? Is it best to do something or do you need to do it properly or consistently? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I can I can see where you're going with this. Yeah. There is a lot of meditation and mindful stuff around. Uh, I, and as I said, with martial arts generally, it's a broad church. Yeah. Um, my, mindfulness is very simple. I mean, the word's very simple. You, you can see what it means. You know, the, the whole purpose, and a lot of people will teach mindfulness, but they'll phrase it in a way that suits the customer. So um, they're, they're putting it across, uh, being very careful not to talk about religion, not to talk yeah. So, you know, kind of keeping it um, fairly neutrally based. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness is about awareness. Uh, you know, we say, you know, mind the gap, mind the child. Yep. You know, so mindfulness is, is being careful with your mind. Um, and it's not something that you do for an hour a day. It's, it's, it is a lifestyle. 
Yeah. And I think that it comes down to we we all know that we're conscious, but we can't describe what consciousness is. Yeah. Right. So consciousness is unconditioned, and that's what gives us our awareness. Whatever else you want to attach to that, really, mindfulness is um, understanding that you're made of something that's unconditioned. The thing that's looking out of your eyes is unconditioned. And that is your consciousness and it's your awareness. We all have it. You know, if you talk to yourself, how do I describe my consciousness? You just can't do it. Yeah, yeah. But you, you, you know you're conscious and you're aware of it. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's a, a fairly basic, straightforward thing. When you're aware and you, you're looking at the conditioned from the unconditioned, you can see it for what it really is. That's the aspects of mindfulness. It's being careful with your mind. It's being careful with your behavior. Um, it's being careful or mindful with everything that you do in your life. So if it doesn't spread out to all of your life, it's, it's, it's not mindfulness. Yeah. Yeah. And to, to be mindful all of the time requires you to have the discipline um, and the resolve to make sure that you are always connected to the source. If you're always connected to the condition, you are always watching your mind. That's what mindful is. Yeah. I am watching my mind. I'm watching my thoughts, I'm watching my behavior, I'm watching what I do, I am being mindful. It is that basic. Yeah. You don't need to attach anything more to it. To help you to calm down, to be able to be mindful, it helps if you can breathe deeply. When you breathe deeply, your body will calm down, your emotions will calm down, and your mind will calm down. So. To enable you to breathe deeply, you must have good posture because otherwise you can't use the right muscles to be able to breathe. So we know that deep breathing and good posture yeah. are the requirements um, to be able to calm down enough to sit still and sit quiet, to let your thoughts dissipate, to let your emotions calm down, to reach that state of mindfulness. And once you've found that connection, you've got to be able to maintain it. And that's the basis really of all the teaching that I give. Where does, uh, would you class meditation and mindfulness as uh, two completely separate things? And, and if so, where does meditation fit into your, your daily practice or your, your life practice, I guess? So mindfulness is the state of your mind. So if you are connected, I mean, if you was a Buddhist, you would say that is Dharma. Dharma is the unconditioned. So if you are connected to, to if you like, the unconditioned mm -hmm. and you're being mindful, that is your state of mind. If you want to focus that mindful state on subjects, that will become meditation. Okay. So... In that mindful state, you will have insight into everything that you look at. So again, if, if I revert back to a, a kind of Buddhist explanation, um, samadhi is, is absorption. That's when you connect to the, the unconditioned state, if you like. Um, so samadhi would be the first stage. The second stage would be vipassana. Vipassana is insight into anything that you look at. Mm. So the differences are, mindfulness is a state of being, meditation is something that you do with it. Okay, yeah, no, that, uh, again, uh, you, you can always tell, you can always tell the people who have the understanding of it, because they're able to put it in a very, uh, and I mean this positively, simple way, uh, yeah. you, you, you clearly understand and then you're able to, to, to share that, share that knowledge. Uh, it's so simple that most people miss it. You know, it, it's an open door that anyone can yeah. walk through so easily. Uh, but everybody seems to want to complicate it, market it, 
put frames, and the moment you try to put frames around it, you're creating conditions. So how can you create a condition to get to the unconditioned? Uh, and what I'd say there is, you know, beyond the unconditioned, everything is a condition. So the moment you have a name or a frame or a word or a thought, you are creating conditions. Yeah. Right? So you can have positive conditions where they point to the unconditioned, and you can have negative conditions that will take you away from the unconditioned. So if you can stay rooted in a mindful state and look at everything with insight, whatever conditions you have will be good. And they'll point to that part of you. So you know, if you say to me, you know, Steve, you're a master. I'm not a master. A master is just a word. It's a condition. But it's meaningless, isn't it? Yeah. You can give me as many certificates and awards or whatever as you want. It doesn't matter to me because that's not who I am. I'd smile and shake your hand and say thanks very much yeah. if I happen to, to, to be there, but it, it's, it's not who I am. I understand for me to remain sane and not go down all those mental and emotional rabbit holes that I've done in the past, I need to stay connected, I need to stay rooted in the unconditioned. Then I can live an insightful life. If you'd met me 35 years ago, I was an idiot because I didn't know any different. You know, I, I was a typical council, council state, yobbo, you know, fighting, only wanted to fight and do that. I really wouldn't want to talk about it, but I, you know, if you'd known me that long ago, I, I was an idiot. And it, it took, you know, that path with a little bit of discipline and resolve to discover the unconditioned and to positively root myself there. The Buddha said, you know, once you build a house, you've got to keep the roof in good repair. Indeed. You know, so <laughs> it, it requires this. I, I, I get a lot of messages in my inbox from people with anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I get a lot. I, people must read my page and think he's a good guy to ask these questions. Yeah. Um, but one of the problems is that a lot of people um, won't have the discipline to uh, work with it. If you think of how long it took them, uh, the road that they took to become anxious, how long it took them, all the thoughts they had, the emotions they have, the build up to it to get to that state, um, they don't seem to want to do, just roll that path backward yeah. um, to get back to the beginning, the amount of discipline and resolve that it takes. T talking about, you just mentioned that again there about growing up in to use your words, an idiot. Uh, how? And again, I know this 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 next question that's that's in my head at the moment could could probably fill a book. Never mind that an hour long podcast. But if you can just pick wee bits, uh, what what were the main areas where all of your martial arts journey helped you to get to where you are? If you could just sort of pinpoint certain bits to say. This is who I am now, and this is who I was 40 years ago, and, and these are the main attri attributes of martial arts. Let's say this was a question for people listening who had no experience about martial arts at all and just thought it was you go and you bow and then you fight each other and, 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 and that's it. Yeah, I, someone asked me a while back, um, you know, if I could train with anybody living or dead, um, to, you know, now, if I could go and train with that person, who would I pick to train with? Yeah. Um, and my answer was me. I remember this post, yeah. Yeah, well, and they said, well, that's a bit arrogant, isn't it? Yes, well, but, I, you know, I've become the martial artist that I always wanted to, to teach me. Yeah. So I, I think right from the beginning, you know, back in the 70s, I was working in the security trade. I, I was, I suppose, a bit of a nutter or an idiot or whatever. I, I, Started martial arts originally about fighting, but when David Carradine came on the scene, I looked at the, the Buddhist temple and the philosophy and the bits where the picture went all wobbly and he was back in the temple. I loved it. Yeah. And so from that point, I aspired to um, I aspired to that philosophy, not so much the martial arts, but the yeah. philosophy. And in so doing, I found a Tai Chi teacher and um, a guy called Simon Wired, and, and he gave me my first copy of the Tao Te Ching. I'd never read a book, 
um, up until that point. And uh, the moment that I opened that book and started reading, it meant a lot to me. I've given it to people over the years, and you can see they kind of put it on the bookshelf and, and don't even bother because they don't understand it. But it meant a lot to me that the Taoist philosophy really hit home. That led me on to uh, studying just everything I could get my hands on. So um, Buddhism, Zen, I, you know, I went to Buddhist monasteries, I, I listened to Dharma talks, I, I studied Zen, I even looked at all our Western pagan religions yeah, yeah. and so on. Anything I could get my hands on to do uh, with that kind of mindfulness. Um, and that's the path that I primarily followed. And I can remember my Japanese karate instructor was always look, reading books on science and psychology, which actually was very helpful to me because he provided that side of it. But he was always saying to me, why are you reading these books on Buddhism? You should be reading how the brain works and so on. Yeah. Um, but so I, you know, I went through many different instructors and, and they were all great teachers, you know, without a doubt. You know, people like Toru Takamizawa was the best karate teacher I've ever seen in my life. You know, he, he was lightning fast. Um, and if you wanted to look at good water, he would, I would suggest he would have been the person, he's not here now, but yeah. you know, he would have been the person to, to look to. And Iaido, Okamitsu Fuji. Um, and I, I had private lessons with all of these instructors, all of them for more than 10 years, some for up to 20. Uh, Okimitsu Fuji for me was a great Budo man and um, you know, he, he loved to drink, I used to go and drag him out of his house on a Tuesday morning, <laughs> take him down the Irishman's club um, and he'd probably have about three pints while he was training me but I learned so much from him, it, it was brilliant yeah. uh, and when he went back to Japan, Vic Cook was, was a great Iaido and Jodo instructor and um, and then further in Tai Chi, going to Jim Aglo. Jim is an excellent Bungar Kung Fu guy, um, as, as well as Yang style Tai Chi. And I learned a lot about Kung Fu from him. Mm -hmm. And he very kindly took me to Hong Kong to uh, Mary Yang. And uh, we were, I think we were the first people to go over when she started teaching. Um, and I learned a lot from her as well. So I learned a lot from all the different teachers, but I think a lot of my knowledge has come from outside of the martial arts. Yeah. But, do you know, what, one, of the, one of the ways, and again, I hope e even, even my own students, and, and you're actually one of the people who, who I reference a lot in classes, and uh, I will direct people to say, go and check this out on Facebook or YouTube or, or whatever, so that I, I, I mention yourself a lot in classes, and... One of the things that I spent, one of the things from spending a lot of time watching posts that you put up and videos and et cetera, et cetera, is your, your kindness and compassion. And that, that interests me a lot because, and again, going back, so that there's, you've, you've painted a really good picture of who you were before you started. And I, I don't think, would I be right in saying that you maybe not, Describe yourself as being kind and compassionate. <laughs> I can Most certainly that. not. <laughs> yeah. But I, yeah. if you were to look through your social media feeds and the videos that you post, you you come across as certainly being that now. Uh, mm. Martial arts must have played a... And not just the... When you and I are talking about martial arts, we're not just talking about the hours spent in the dojo or the dojang or the training hall. Because martial arts to us is for when you wake up in the morning to you go to bed at night time type yeah. thing. So what played the most important parts in turning you from, and again, I'll quote you, an idiot, to mm. a really kind and compassionate member of society? Yeah, I think most likely if I, if I hadn't have progressed with the martial arts, I would be in prison without a doubt. Uh, and I think that... Um, in the beginning, I, I mean, I was brought up, my father was uh, a commando in the Second World War. He was a prison officer, so he dealt with everything with his fists. And um, so I was brought up with the idea of if they do this, give them a slap. Yeah. Um, that was the answer to everything. 
the, the first clubs that I joined were much the same way. If you didn't like someone, you just beat, beat, beat them up. And, and if you, uh, you know, if you meet people that knew me back in the 70s or whatever, uh, you know, they would really reference me as quite a violent person. Yeah. And I suppose in a way that helped me to formulate the self-defense systems that I went on to teach um, you know, European police forces and presidential bodyguards and so on, um, and a lot of security people. So, you know, I wouldn't, you know, it's, it's an integral part of me. Yeah. Um, but by the same token, um, I think probably the biggest influence on me was the Amaravati monastery, Buddhist monastery, the Theravadan system, and I sometimes went to their Chithurst monastery down in Surrey. Okay. Um, I think the Theravadan Buddhism probably had the biggest impact on me of all, and uh, back in the, oh, I don't know, it's now 80s probably, I, I bought hundreds of their cassette tapes, and people like Ajahn Samedo, um, who luckily is still alive, Ajahn Chah, who isn't, um, Amaro, and people like that, they, they the, the Theravadan system is, is very simple. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really appealed to me, and that helped me a lot. So it, it was things like um, the idea of uh, metta, or patient kindness, um, had a big influence on my meditations as well. Um, as you probably know, I lived to the idea of a soft front and a strong back yeah. to meet everything with patience and kindness and tolerance and compassion, but have the resolve, determination and courage to be able to support it and back it up. Back, you can't have true compassion without the, the two aspects. And um, it's just little things along the way where, where someone would say something like, you know, love is a very difficult word. You can't say love everybody because love can mean you love chocolate, do you love your dog, do uh, whatever. So, you know, love is a very difficult word, but you know, to, to have patience and kindness towards someone is quite doable. Yeah. And you don't even have to like somebody to have patience and kindness towards them. That really struck a chord with me because, and, and it helped to make me a good coach as well, because I realized that you, know, you don't pick and choose your students, you learn something from everybody. Lots of people say that, but they think they, they never do it. Yeah. Um, but quite genuinely, you don't have to, and, and you're learning something about yourself when there's people that you don't like, if you can extend politeness, patience, kindness, and uh, em empathy towards them, yeah. um, that makes a big difference, and that helps to soften my approach to life. So even now, if I'm irritable, which, you know, as you know, I'm in chronic pain, so I can be very grumpy and irritable at times. Um, I can constantly, my mindfulness reminds me, don't be grumpy, don't just bite someone's head off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, be polite, be patient, be courteous, because um, if you're truly rooted in the unconditioned, you are them and they are you. Yeah. So when you look in their eyes, you see yourself looking back. Yeah. And therefore they should be treated in the same way. One another point, uh one of the the one of the, the taekwondo uh grandmasters was a, in Scotland was a lady called Sheena Sutherland and she unfortunately passed away last year and she, like yourself, was very vocal on on social media or in any of the platforms really about uh, some political stuff, but just about injustice overall, to be honest. Mm. And I remember having a discussion with her uh, and I said, does, does it ever worry you that because you have certain political leanings which uh, you, 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 you portray and you give out very freely and openly, does it ever worry you that that might put people off, for example? And, and is, that, is that the place of a martial artist? And again, it's one of those answers that you'll never, you'll never I, I'll never forget. One of the uh, 
one of the, the main teachings of Taekwondo is to be a champion of freedom and justice. Mm. And she said to me, she said, it's not about losing students or, or being in a position where certain people don't want to train with you. If something's right, it's right. And if something has to be said, it has to be said. To be a champion of freedom and justice, that that comes off of your social media in in, in spades. Uh, is that does does that come from your martial arts that you if you want to put that across to people that there's things out there that just aren't right or aren't fair or and I, I, again people can look at your Facebook page if they actually want to see your thoughts on certain political things or aspects but just about the world in general you always seem to want to stick up for what what's right did that come from martial arts yeah i suppose it, it comes from everything i've studied really yeah and you know in effect when we talk about a stock front and a strong back and the unconditioned you know uh, when you look at the word tai chi people see tai chi grand ultimate you know, Chan martial art, grand ultimate martial art, how arrogant is that? But they don't understand that um, the, you know, Tai Chi, the grand ultimate, is the unconditioned. So the idea is that you know, it, it's the martial art of the unconditioned, finding and being able to root yourself in the unconditioned until Tai Chi arrives. So um, <clears throat> it's inherent in every martial art, you know, what a reward, it's the way of peace, the way of peace and harmony, goju, the balance, the soft and hard, this yin yang, um, aikido, uh, becoming a, a person where your inner energies are all in harmony. So it's inherent within every art. I'm not taking something from outside and yeah. putting it into the art. It was there already. Mm -hmm. It just seems to have been sidelined by a lot of people. Um, and I think that Compassion is essential um, in any traditional martial arts. And I think that um, compassion should be everywhere. You know, for, for evil to thrive, all it takes is good men to do nothing. Yeah. You know, so it, it's important to at least have a voice um, and to have a right to have a voice. Uh, and as you know, you know my view is I, I, I will never understand how any human could be left in poverty or suffering without a house, a home, food, medical provision. Um, I just don't understand. Uh, that is totally and completely beyond my understanding. For humanity to actually be humane, surely, you know, looking after the basic requirements of each other, doesn't matter what country, what color, what gender, whatever, you know, everybody should at least have those basic things. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think just, to therefore to bring that to voice, because um, if we are mindful and we are working from the inside out, we're not so heavily influenced by the outside in because we're always applying critical thinking to it. We're always analyzing everything that comes in. And in so doing, I think it's up to the mindful people to um, at least make that individual voice known and i do feel that you know we should be uh we should be voting for compassionate politicians um not for for characters off of love island or or television reality tv or yeah. or whatever you know so yeah. um yeah you know I, I i would make my voice heard because I think it would be wrong of me to not at least speak out. Yeah. I'm, I'm not looking for a violent revolution. Uh, <laughs> I would like it to take place through the ballot box. Yeah. Um, and I would like it to be done kindly and compassionately and the right way. And I think if it, it's one of those things people say to me, you know, Steve, you're an idiot. These things would never happen. And, uh, you know, my answer is that uh, things happen from the ground floor up, mm -hmm. not from the top down. When they're from the top down, it's people dictating and manipulating. But if it can, if we, if normal people can be compassionate, which is what we're really looking for, yeah. um, and that's what we're doing in our clubs, is we're we're teaching people 
um, patient's kindness and compassion, um, that will in the end would reflect itself in the requirement of what we want from our politicians. So if we never used our voice, it would never happen. Yeah. Uh, we might use our voice and it might not happen anyway. The chances are that humanity will wipe itself off the face of the planet. But because we are rooted in the unconditioned, we will still be here in one form or another. Yeah, it's, I, I said this as well. I said, regarding how, uh, and again, we always seem to look to the, 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 we always seem to look to the US all the time. And, and we, we sometimes forget about our own sort of country because we're spending too much, too much time concentrating on the US. Uh, but if you, if you do look at both nations, uh, and even now the way that we've dealt with the, the sort of COVID situation, and this isn't about the politics in Scotland or the politics in Westminster or, or even over in the States, it, the world in general, over and above politics as well, just seems to lack us looking out for each other. We, it yeah. just, it just doesn't seem to happen. It's the, it yeah. seems to be further and further down the list of priorities. Uh, so people like yourself, uh, like Grandmaster Sarland, uh, bless her when she was still alive, etc. Just people willing to say, no, I'm actually going to say this because mm. I believe it needs said. Uh, right, okay. One, one, one last thing, if you don't mind. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is take your 50 years of experience and just share with, with us, share with us, sorry, if possible, some of the best advice you've had over the years that you would you would pass on to anybody that was listening, martial artists primarily, but just just in general. I would encapsulate it in what I said earlier: having a soft front and a strong back. I, I remind myself of that a hundred times a day. Okay. And not only in terms of uh, lifestyle of um, politeness, uh, kindness, patience and compassion, um, to be supported with resolve and determination, but even physically, uh, when practicing a martial art, Tai Chi is often described as an iron bar wrapped in soft cotton or a needle concealed within soft cotton. And um, I would just, you know, when somebody puts their hands up, I meet those, I meet their hands with softness. Yeah. And, but that softness has got um, structure to it and it's got structural integrity. So even if you push against it, it will be supported from my feet. But, you know, you can stick, follow, redirect, blend. In teaching a lot of police and security personnel, that is also absolutely essential. Yeah. that you put your hands up in softness, that you meet an opponent with softness. If you only need to put them in a lock, you'll put them in a lock. Yeah. 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 It, you, you'll do whatever's necessary. It might be Uncle Jim who's drunk at a wedding, so you don't want to jab him in the eye or the throat or something like that. Yeah. And you know, in the security and policing world, 90% of what you do only requires a soft approach. Mm -hmm. And a bit of normally a bit of courtesy and politeness will, will cover the situation. Um, and if you're good at that, it's rare that you'll actually have a physical confrontation. Mm -hmm. But the ability to be able to deal with that, if necessary, up to killing somebody. Yeah. Um, but you know, scale it down, meet it with softness first, and, and see you know, you're, you're, if you've got a soft front, you're reading the other person. You're not, most people, as the confrontation starts to build up, they're, they're more worried about themselves than they are what the other person is or going to do. Yeah. And quite often you find in a confrontation, people are not worried about getting hurt, they're worried about losing face. Yeah, for sure. You know, so the, the, the ego and the self actually plays the biggest part. So if you can get rid of that, then you will reduce your fear levels because you're, you're looking or thinking of the other person, but also how to deal with them and what you need to do to deal with them rather than worrying about how you're going to look or even whether you're going to get hurt. Yeah. So soft front and a strong back in the martial art, in, in a physical confrontation, right the way through to a philosophy for life, 
And when you look at that, it's actually yin and yang, isn't it? Of course. You have yeah. the yin front and the yang back, which is actually natural to us. You know, the, the yang is the energy rising up the spine and the, it's yin energy that drains down the conception vessel. So it's a, a natural way, a nature's way of approaching things. Brilliant. Is there, uh, is there anything else you would like to say or add that, that maybe I haven't covered with the questions that I've asked you today? Well, I, I was reflecting off of you. Of course. <laughs> so I wasn't course. thinking about me. I was, thinking, uh, I, I was playing the same thing really here. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't have a thought in my head when I came on. I just thought, I'll listen to what you've got to say and, and we'll play it along from there. So uh, I, we've probably covered a lot of very important aspects. Yeah. Um, but if anybody else has questions, I'm easy to get in touch with. Uh, and I'm always happy to talk to people. Um, if they message me, particularly on things like uh, social media, it's the best way because my phone is always on silent. So I'll, I'll virtually never answer that. Yeah. But, you know, text or messaging is uh, is a good way to stay in contact because then I can deal with something when I've got the time. Right. So if you send me a complicated question, I might read it, but then I can't answer it straight away, but I'll do it within the next day or so. Brilliant. And I know that you're on Facebook, Instagram, and you've got a Twitter account as well. Right. Yeah, I'm on, on, on everything. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay. Uh, fairly, fairly easy to find. Uh, and the other thing that I, I would say is, you know, if you are interested in you know, my philosophy or my martial art, the only thing that I teach at the moment is my um, Tai Chi coaching program. Okay. And if you go on to my blog, which is uh, steve-row.com, yep, yep. uh, it's the first thing that will come up and you can read about it if you want to join it. But you know, I'm 70, struggling with my health, uh, so I'm having to meter out my, my time very carefully yep. and the coaching program is the thing that is working very well. I've got 58 people on it at the moment yep. well, and um, if, if you want to learn my touchy, that would be the best way of going about it. Just, it's a burden. Just as you, as you mentioned there, just sort of metering out your time, uh, it's another reason why just to thank you again. Uh, I was really excited today about getting you onto the podcast uh, and just getting those wee bits of knowledge about sort of lots of different subjects. So, right, I will let you go there, sir. Uh, Steve Rowe, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Craig. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.